for those that have joined our conversations before, you know that this is part of our series of conversations with the data science folks uh, called Making Data Science Work. Uh, so I'm Indra and along with Venkata from Scribble Data, uh, we play host to this conversation and we learn a bunch along the way. So uh, it's, this is as much for us as it is for you. Um, at Scribble Data, of course, we are an ML teacher store company, but our conversations here tend to be fairly broad ranging. And in fact, today's conversation is a sort of testimony to that because we are now talking about um, about something that gets a lot of lip service nowadays, but mm. actually infusing it into our DNA, that's, that's a harder call. When we have to actually make sure that we are walking the talk, it's, it's a little bit harder. So today's session is about doing data science with ethics. And uh, we had originally have, uh, two panelists slotted. Unfortunately, Ashwin from Fidelity couldn't be here because of some logistical reasons and others. But we do have Suchana and uh, Suchana said, uh, well, I mean, uh, there's a lot I can tell you about her. I'll just start with a, with a few highlights and then I'll ask her to speak about it. So Suchana in the past has been a Mozilla Open Web Fellow at Data and Society and a fellow and affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Um, her research focuses on ways to operationalize ethical machine learning and responsible AI in the industry. And she has a broad range of interests from auditing algorithms for fairness, accountability, and transparency. Um, she's interested in and very passionate about closing the gender gap in data science and leads data science workshops with organizations like Women Who Code. So we have a lot of landscape to cover with her and uh, a lot of uh, questions because even in when we were discussing about the, the various topics we touch upon today, we found so many different rabbit holes that we wanted to go down. Sometimes we felt like the one hour wouldn't be enough, but uh, let's see where today's conversation goes. So Suchana, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Indra. Yeah. And thank you, Venkata. And thank you for putting together this lovely series of uh, sessions. I mean, the topics are incredibly interesting and relevant. So it's it's great effort. Thanks for putting this together and having me here today. It's, it's entirely our pleasure. So Suchana, one of the things that we'd like to quickly sort of bracket right at the start is uh, maybe a couple of points along what got you into doing what you're doing right now. Some of the some of what the meandering finally landed on. Yeah, if you could talk about <laughs> yeah. that, that would be great. Yeah, just before we started off, Indra and I were talking about how, uh, you know, sometimes uh, interesting career paths tend to have some unexpected detours along the way, or they take a meandering route that you would not necessarily have expected at the start of it. So um, my background is in theoretical physics, and I did my master's, and I have a few years of research under my belt. Um, and, uh, you know, while I was doing my research in theoretical physics, uh, I became increasingly interested in um, sort of the intersection of machine learning with theoretical physics. And then eventually it dawned on me that, you know, there is a lot of scope for application of ML in the industry as well. And data science was just sort of taking off in India at that point. So I made the switch to the industry. And I think um, all along, I have been interested in a lot of these rabbit holes that again, Indra was talking about. Uh, a lot of it is philosophy and hopefully we won't digress too much into philosophical territory here today. We will sort of stick to more hands-on practical checklists, tools, workflows, rubrics, that kind of stuff. But I was definitely interested in what are the best practices for machine learning? How do we do responsible machine learning even before these things became a buzzword maybe? And Mm, along the way, I was very fortunate to have volunteered with organizations like DataKind, who, uh, you know, who bring together data scientists who want to do pro bono work uh, with nonprofits who have data, but not necessarily the resources or the talent to utilize that data, right? So when I was mentioning data science sessions with organizations like DataKind, I began to realize that there's something of a gap in terms of, uh, you know, we as data scientists, either, you know, whether we are self-taught or whether we go through formal courses, we pick up a lot of technical uh, stuff about what are the different ML models we could build. Uh, but what we do not learn are some extremely important pragmatic stuff like what's their scope, what's their applicability, what could go wrong when we build these models? How do we make sure that our uh, end users sort of understand how best to use these models and apply them and make sense of them, right? So as I began thinking about all of uh, these things in the course of my work as well, um, I think, you know, it was very fortunate that Mozilla started their open web fellowship programs and they really wanted to build a whole network of public interest technologists 
which is sort of a fantastic thing to happen. And I think there's more need for it than ever that we look at technology through the lens of public interest as more and more of our, you know, I would say critical infrastructures, our democratic infrastructures, our uh, social and commercial infrastructures are sort of being dominated by different technologies are being dominated by different corporate players, I would say. So I think there's definitely a role for public interest technologists to make sense of all this and, and sort of, you know, protect our rights and to push tech in the right direction. So I feel very fortunate that the Mozilla Fellowship, uh, you know, sort of connected me with this wonderful network of people across the world who sort of think similarly and work on similar issues. And, and, mm. and then, you know, my stint at Harvard also was like extremely rewarding. So that's been my path. And like I said, it's, it's been a little, uh, you know, I couldn't have expected or anticipated all of the steps in advance. And um, I sort of, I want to say this, you know, for the sake of pretty much everyone out there who wants to go on an adventure and is perhaps wondering where will this lead me? Go for it. <laughs> it can't yeah. hurt you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Sushana, actually, you've touched upon a few different points when uh, already in, in, in this introduction, and I would love to understand from you. Do you think, where do you think ideally the, uh, the slow permeation of uh, ethics into data science should come from? Is it from good hearted data scientists who are thinking about doing the right thing? Is it within corporations who are thinking right from the start, we, we shall not be evil, even if our motto changes along the way at some point? Mm -hmm. Or is it in the form of governments looking after their, their people and instituting strict guidelines, whether it is data privacy guidelines or other ethical boundaries, where, what's the ideal path? Maybe it's a combination, but what's an ideal path? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's, it's obvious that it's a combination, but having said that, I want to call out a couple of things. These are, you know, personal opinions and uh, I do recognize that they've been different points of view as well. But uh, the first thing I want to say is that the regulatory landscape and pretty much any effort that any government across the world makes to regulate technology is going to be somewhat reactive at best. Right. So it's, it's, you know, the pace at which technology changes. And I mean, I, for one, you know, sort of love the fact that we innovate so quickly. Uh, but it also means that it's very difficult given, you know, given the amount of time and the amount of human effort that it put, takes to put together credible regulations, um, the regulatory landscape will necessarily be reactive, right? It cannot anticipate every possible advance and it cannot uh, provide, uh, you know, legally for those uh, situations that might arise. So maybe it's best not to place all of our hopes, you know, in, in that one egg in that basket. Uh, and I think in terms of, you know, corporate ownership of ethics, um, I think a lot of companies do really well. But again, having said that, I tend to be a little cynical as part of my professional uh, work. And I would say that very frankly, it is our friend. You know, yeah, absolutely. It is our friend. So while, it's, it's, uh, while good intentions are fantastic and no one's doubting them, but at the same time, I think AI systems should certainly aim for verifiability for all of the claims that we make of them, right? Yeah. Whether it's a robustness claim or whether it's a fairness claim or a transparency claim, I think we should have verifiability built in. And I think that's really key to having accountable systems as well and having auditable systems as well. And we will touch upon all these aspects, right? Accountability yeah. and auditability, hopefully in the course of our talk today. Mm, but yeah, no verifiability uh, doesn't work for me, yeah. right? Uh, that came to my mind is that it is not that uh, we have not been here when lasers were developed, when nuclear technology was developed um, uh, and a whole lot of uh, bioweapons, for example, when they were mm. developed. Uh, over a period of time, we developed the, the institutional framework, the, uh, the accountability mechanisms for all of them. Um, it almost seems like, uh, you know, if you look at all of them, they took you know, 30, 40, 50 years uh, mm. for them to develop, uh, whether it mm. is the Starts Treaty, whether it is the the Biological Review Board uh, that yeah. uh, departments have and, and so on. It almost seems like that whole process is now extremely compressed and it is happening at a time we when we don't know the, uh, the parameters still of uh, mm. the whole ML uh, scape in uh, what is the class of applications? What is the degree of impact, nature of impact, um, time frame of impact, mm. uh, and, and so on. 
um, it's uh, uh, how do we uh, cope with uh, or how are, how is the the uh, coping happening today? Right? Given that it's all being impacting a large number of people. Uh, for example, all the loans increasingly are going to be scored. You will be measured against mm. uh, some model will assess your risk and then give you. So the mm. impact is here. The institutions and the the uh, mental frameworks to understand and evaluate all of these things are lagging behind already, mm. even before the regulation comes. Right. So I think we already do have some robust, you know, institutions and institutionalized learning that we have in place. For example, uh, IEEE is developing a whole set of standards that relate to algorithmic bias, right? And I'm part of one of those efforts, the P7003 standard, but there are also a few other standards within that same family uh, that have to do with algorithmic transparency, that have to do with uh, autonomous vehicles, that have to do with ethics of intelligent systems. And so I would say, you know, that's just one example of uh, a non-government kind of a self-regulation, developing checks and balances kind of an approach. And I don't think it's a bad approach at all. So I think some of our older institutions uh, will translate quite well to this new landscape uh, as well. But having said that, there are, uh, I think, a few crucial aspects that make this whole uh, machine learning and AI regulatory landscape a little different, you know, which is... Mm, one, algorithms have the capacity to amplify harm, right? Or to amplify benefits. So the thing is, you know, if you have a machine learning algorithm, you suddenly have the capacity to impact people at scale, you know? And that scale is very, very different from, um, you know, the, the scale at which, let's say, if you're selling an individual vehicle, even an autonomous vehicle to an individual consumer, the scale of that is very different from, you know, the scale with which social media is entering our lives and touching almost every part of our lives, right? And the other thing I want to call out, you know, uh, this scale and amplification is one aspect. The other aspect is the networked nature of, of machine learning and AI, you know? So, for instance, if you take data privacy, right? Um, it's not a simple matter of me protecting my privacy. I have to worry about what my friends are saying about me on that, you know, for my privacy to be fully protected. And that's something that I don't necessarily have any choice, control, or consent over. So this network nature is, again, uh, something that we should shape carefully around and, and think deeply about when uh, we build products or make regulations, right? So, um, you know, if you consider things like IoT, for example, right? here are possible ways that devices in your home can be hacked. So call me an alarmist, call me paranoid, right? But that's my job. So, you know, here, here are ways True. that, uh, you know, that privacy inside our homes can be compromised, right? Take wearable devices, for instance. Take, uh, you know, the obvious marriage between wearable devices and social media. A lot of us are, you know, doing exercises, you know, logging our runs and stuff on Fitbit, sharing it on social media, earning kudos, whatever it is, right? So these are all uh, examples of the networked way in which we need now need to think about our rights, our privacy, the impact that machine learning algorithms can have. And I think these are two key differences, I would say. Yeah, wasn't there that matter about uh, Strava, the wearable company? that was uh, highlighting where CIA bases or, or, or uh, armed forces bases were because yes. soldiers were wearing them and exercising, uh, yes. not knowing that all of that is being tracked. Um, yes. So, Sujana, so, uh, if we step uh, so, sort of almost into the field of data science now, um, mm -hmm. as, as a data scientist, what should, how should they think about this? What should, how should they think about their responsibility uh, when 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 they're asked to be ethical or when you know they're doing data science and they have there's this voice at the back of their heads that's saying uh hopefully it's saying uh, i should be ethical especially in the context of their kpis their individual kpis not necessarily being aligned to what is considered ethical mm. So I think, you know, uh, this, this whole alignment problem, I mean, you know, in the, in the field of AI, we tend to talk about outer alignment and inner alignment as two core problems in AI safety. And I think it has analogs and mirrors in human life as well, right? How do we get our KPIs to align to our, our stated values or our not so clearly stated values, right? So that's definitely an org culture problem. But uh, I would want to begin from the fact that data scientists have a tremendous amount of power. Let's not forget that. So if you look at the whole uh, ML production chain, right? Uh, I think data scientists are best placed to understand 
the big picture as well as the details. So we understand where the data is coming from, what the data is like, what are the challenges with the data. We understand why we made certain decisions while building the prototype, you know, in terms of choice of model, choice of hyperparameters, and so on. We also understand, you know, what choices we may have made during deployment. You know, maybe we decided to put, uh, you know, we decided to consume the prediction of the actual model by coupling it along with some handwritten heuristics or rules based on our business understanding, right? So we understand the entire shape perhaps better than anybody else involved in the production of uh, ML systems, you know? Uh, so given that power, I think we are best placed also to call out potential harm that can arise, you know? A uh, lot, of, lot of consequences can be foreseen in the sense that uh, you know, I hope we will talk about it in some detail later in the conversation. But uh, if you think about this business of choosing the right metric to optimize, right? Uh, sometimes in hindsight, it seems blindingly obvious that if, if, you know, since we chose this particular metric, we could have almost predicted how users are going to game it, even if we do optimize for this metric, right? So I think these are conversations that should not happen in silos. Definitely data scientists should engage with all stakeholders as far as possible. We should talk to product managers, we should talk to actual users, you know, we should talk to ML engineers, we should talk to, you know, folks on the business side of things when we try to identify, you know, what kind of consequences or harms can arise or what are really the right metrics to optimize for. But there are also uh, some very interesting nuances to things like accuracy, right? That again, we are best placed to understand. So for instance, we should be calling out what is the cost of a false positive? What is the real cost? You know, what is the real cost of a false negative with the prediction that my system is making? And so, you know, what are some realistic accuracy goals that we should be setting for ourselves? And, you know, uh, what does that goal really translate to in terms of a business action, right? So what happens if we have a false positive? What is going to be the real cost to the users downstream? So uh, just to give you an example, right? There was some terrific uh, research by Joy Bulwamini and Timit Gebru, MIT and Microsoft, who showed that IBM's facial recognition software had an error rate imbalance with respect to gender and with respect to race. So what I'm talking about here in simple terms is that the facial recognition algorithm would make more mistakes with people of color and it would make more mistakes with women and it would make even more mistakes with women of color. You know, and uh, this is the sort of thing that, well, hindsight is 2020, but this is the sort of thing that is quite easy to correct in the prototyping stage where you're making your model choices, where you're curing your hyperparameters. It's a very simple question to ask, right? Should be part of everybody's checklist that if I were to take my accuracy and I were to look at my error rates across different demographic classes that I have, whatever is of interest to, whether it's, you know, gender or whether it's race or whether it's ethnic identity or whatever other demographic parameter might be of interest to me, right? It's quite simple to do this check and it can, you know, prevent the kind of embarrassment that later, uh, well, IBM did. To be fair, IBM went on to make some massive improvements to the way that they were uh, constructing their training data sets. So their facial recognition software training data set is now much more diverse and much more inclusive. So, you know, great that this outside research kind of made that change happen, but perhaps that research shouldn't have been necessary in the first place. Yeah, and just on the IBM point though, it, my recent understanding is, despite them having made some efforts to correct the imbalance, they've actually taken it offline because of other ethical okay. considerations, right? Okay, yeah. uh, in fact, several other companies, Amazon included, have actually chosen not to sell facial recognition software for surveillance applications, particularly to uh, you know, police departments and to governments. And this is, you know, uh, I think that's sort of a fantastic example of uh, what happens when an organization articulates its values, uh, you know, perhaps does an internal reality check in terms of what do our employees want, where do we stand with regard to values, and then takes a call based on that, right? Uh, I think about a couple of years back, uh, Google uh, decided, you know, based on employee pushback and, you know, that they were not going to do uh, an AI project for the US Department of Defense. So that's, that's again, a fantastic victory. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Actually, this is from one of our uh, panelists, uh, Yanis. Yanis, thank you for asking this. Uh, he asks, what about building technology for controlling technology? In, obviously, in the ethical landscape. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any, do we know of any such examples? And if there, if there are, are there any concrete standards that one can 
uh, based such technology upon? Any anything comes to mind? Technology. Yeah. For- so so there's a whole spectrum of technologies that are actually being developed for this, right? So. Uh, one set of technologies have to do with being able to audit algorithms and you can automate that to the degree that is possible. Although I would always favor human in the loop systems simply because we are not quite there yet in terms of, uh, yeah, imagining every possible thing. Right? There are always unknown unknowns and humans are still a little bit better at, at getting a handle on unknown unknowns than AI systems are just now. So uh, there are ways to interrogate AI systems, right? Where Basically, uh, you know, imagine that you have this API, right? There is a prediction system. It's a black box. You don't know what it's doing, but you know what its input is supposed to be. And, you know, you can give it an input and you can get a prediction as output and you can look for different kinds of discrimination. You can look for different kinds of biases. You can, uh, and also you can uh, kind of do interpretability probes. You can ask, you know, counterfactual style questions. What would happen if I were to change uh, the input just a little bit. How would the prediction change then, right? Right. So right. these are all, uh, and there is a whole spectrum of uh, tools that are being developed, which are at different points in the automation spectrum, I would say. But they all, right. uh, you know, they're all in a sense an automated way of interrogating an algorithm. If that's what Yanis was. Asking. True. True. Except, I mean, not except, but rather maybe adding on to that point, which is that it seems to me that while these technologies can be built, can probably do exist, probably are useful. It Mm -hmm. depends on the context in which they're being used because one narrow and probably uh, extensive use case for all of this is just to see how well the technologies, how well the algorithms are performing rather than putting on the ethical lens to look for biases, especially for biases in race and gender, because you're thinking about fairness, because you're thinking about, uh, you know, social equality and all of that. Instead, you could just use that same technology and say, uh, how well is it performing? I am, you know, I'm under indexed in this, in this field versus that, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, I think that human in the loop, like you said, not just because of, the unknown unknowns, but also because somewhere there needs to be an infusion of values about how you're doing this too. I absolutely agree with you, Indra, but I also want to call out this perhaps false dichotomy that, uh, and it's a provocation that I'm throwing out there for the audience as well to consider. Maybe, you know, there isn't always a tension between accuracy and fairness. So let's say that if you were to have a disproportionately high error rate for a certain group of people, then that's a kind of unfairness in itself, right? So even if your goal was a very narrow goal of just optimizing for accuracy, right? Even simply by optimizing for accuracy, you would end up optimizing for certain kinds of fairness. And that sort of brings us back to the reality check in terms of tensions and trade-offs, right? So um, there are any number of possible definitions of fairness, for instance, right? There's a fantastic talk by Arvind Narayanan a couple of years back at the Fatimal conference where he talk about, talked about 21 definitions of fairness and their political implications, their political context in which they are to be applied, right? And there are tensions and trade-offs between them. Optimizing for one kind of fairness, you do so at the cost of optimizing for another kind of fairness, right? Mm-hmm. So. This, uh, this this challenge of first articulating our values and then translating those values into metrics is something that is there pretty much in every system you consider. It, it doesn't yeah. go away and that's at the heart yeah. of doing AI ethics. Right? Yeah. How do I go from articulating something subjective and not very tangible like a value or a preference that I have or how do I elicit that from my users, you know, their value preferences and then how do I map it onto a tangible metric which I can yeah. then optimize for. And yeah. then how do I also articulate the tensions around, well, if we optimize for this particular metric, uh, how does that play against my interpretability requirements? How does that play against the accountability structures that we need to set up? How does that play against my accuracy goals, right? Absolutely. The other sort of provocation I want to throw out there is who do all of you, who do, you know, who all of us collectively think should be deciding these things, you know? Should mm. it just be a single ML engineer who maybe defaults to system settings? Or should it just be the entire data science team? Uh, you know, should it be the entire organization, you know, in town halls? Right? Yeah. So uh, while I'm prescriptive about the questions we should ask, I'm not prescriptive about the answers. Sure. So these are definitely things that we should start thinking about That's collectively and you know, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, data scientists should not own this. On the contrary, we should definitely be driving these conversations. But I am saying that we need inputs from every stakeholder possible. You know, Sushana, one counter uh, example to that 
whole concept of if we uh, look for accuracy, we will try and get fairness as well. Hmm. Uh, one not example, all kinds of fairness. No, no, yeah. not, not, not yeah. all kinds, but one uh, prominent example comes to mind where if, for example, the ML recommendation engine for YouTube videos hmm. was doing its job well, it would get you to click onto the next video or watch the next video. Whereas at the same time, that that success there by that accuracy might end up doing the kind of polarization in views exactly. and in mindset that you might not want. Yes, and this is, you know, there was quite a bit of, uh, you know, uh, quite a bit of noise in, in, the, in the press about this as well, right? So this brings me back to the tensions that I was talking about, right? So are we choosing the right metrics to optimize for, right? And none of these conversations can happen in isolation. So, uh, you know, just like in the whole data science workflow, you know, there is uh, there is kind of a, a loop-like quality to it. So we build a model, we test it out, we're not quite happy with its performance, we come back to the drawing board, maybe choose a different model or choose to optimize the model differently, right? I think mm -hmm. ethics needs to have that same loop-like quality to it in the conversations that we do, because certain consequences are easy to anticipate, certain consequences are not. And so sometimes you will only learn these things by doing a field test or maybe by shadowing some existing models and you see how your own model plays out and the, uh, the, the metric it optimizes for and what the consequences are. So then we need to go back to the drawing board and ask, okay, perhaps we need to change the metric we are optimizing for, which in turn means we need to optimize, you know, we need to change all of the other uh, considerations as well. We need to ask what fairness criteria should we be thinking about now in the light of this right. new metric that we have chosen. Right, right. So it, it, it's not a, a, a you know, a, I apologize for being a little vague perhaps, but it's difficult to discuss this without like a concrete case in mind. Yeah, well, on the one hand, the concrete case, and on the other hand, the, the underlying philosophy as well. Venkata, sorry, I've been completely hogging the channel. Please interrupt as you see fit. But, but, but I... Yeah, good. Interesting and riveting uh, topic. See, the the cases that actually bubble up um, in the uh, in the community, like the YouTube case, right? Those are um, after a point, it is it is obvious to everyone that there is there is a uh, ethical question here. But mm -hmm. when I look at the life of a uh, average data scientist, you know, they're trying to sell coffee and all of those kinds of things. My uh, big concern or the, the, uh, the, the question that I have uh, in mind is not the clearly identifiable case, but the, um, the cases that are slightly nuanced that you have to spend a little bit of time thinking about mm -hmm. them. And then they, they pass just because it is not very obvious in the first go uh, to you. Mm -hmm. right? For example, yeah. this, uh, even if you, for example, in the YouTube case, one is the, the most obvious uh, click related problem. But if you look at the complex ecosystem of YouTube itself, how many other places are there uh, unnoticed ethical issues where people didn't think much and it, they thought it was just a mechanical activity and somehow it is it built into the process, the tooling, the, the interface, the language, yeah. there is some bias. So much I'm worried about the dog that didn't bark than the dog that barked. yeah yeah absolutely agree with you Venkata in fact you know I think that's where sort of uh, you know the the term scientist you know which is part of the term data scientist really matters I think this kind of critical reflection should be part of every stage of our workflow right. Uh, and it helps if at the beginning of the design process, we are asking about the possible kinds of harm that can arise. And we can provide a little bit of a structure to that question by asking things like, what are the representational harms? What are the allocational harms? Because as long as you're formulating the problem in terms of a vague ethics goal, right? It's, it's difficult, it's nebulous, it's difficult to know where to begin. But when you make it a little more concrete and ask who can this system, and I don't mean just the machine learning model, but I mean the larger software system or the, or the larger platform that it's a part of, right? Who can this actually harm? And uh, you know, what I mean by representational harm is that am I, you know, is this product or is this solution by making a prediction, is it reinforcing entrenched stereotypes, right? Am I continuing to represent a misrepresented group of people in a bad way, right? That's representational harm. And then you can think about allocational harm, right? Which is where you're asking, am I depriving people of a set of resources by making the prediction in a certain way? So, you know, there are documented instances of where uh, women are not necessarily shown advertisements for jobs that are very highly paid or that are senior leadership roles as compared to men, right? Mm -hmm. It's a thing. So, <laughs> so that's, you know, that's like a classic example of uh, allocational no. harm. 
after i get over my embarrassment at the state of affairs so <laughs> <laughs> intention wasn't uh, to no no i know i know like, yeah. i know i know it's just so yeah, prevalent i, I was amazed as well when i kind of learned about it a couple of years back although there there are more i think egregious examples are you guys familiar with the one where uh, you know that there, there are these uh, taps with motion sensors that don't work so well for dark skin people i thought that was even more embarrassing like this wow. is you're talking about taps in public in fact like you know airport bathrooms and things like that i mean <laughs> no that the pervasiveness of this problem is what requires this conversation and okay. that are going to come okay. uh, because they they are at all scales of application okay. in, in all uh, uh, different experiences that uh, we as uh, you know citizens humans employees uh, yeah. have so one uh, related uh, uh, question again from uh, yanis um, uh, yanis is is complaining saying that i'm talking too much about selling coffee right? <laughs> no, that that might have been as i know i yes <laughs> it is i was in my previous life i was selling coffee so you know with my data <laughs> skills that's the problem okay so he he writes um uh um, since you have written uh, extensively about the the um, uh, this is this is zainab venkata huh? this is all zainab oh zainab Zainab. yeah yeah zainab not yanis uh, uh, um uh, can you share i mean we can take it now or later share, can you share how the the law and the privacy bill that is in the works um, how will it impact uh, ethics or uh, the impact, the role of law in the whole ethics conversation itself hmm yeah so i i think you know uh, this is a really complicated question you know if only because yeah, i think yeah. privacy is a small part of the of the conversation around ethics right it's only one small piece of it and <laughs> so you know there is this whole um, product liability angle to it as well which is another rich vein of discussion that maybe we can you know consider as a standalone discussion in itself but you know if you sort of look at uh, you know legal efforts around the world starting from gdpr in the european union right so there is the rights and protecting rights based approach to governing ai which is great but then from a very bread and butter you know e-commerce just machine learning in industry perspective there is the product liability angle as well what happens if my ai system does something that it wasn't supposed to do and it uh, you know it causes harm so who is liable to what degree for it and and how much and all of these pieces also intersect with the privacy conversation right mm. but having said that i think i think again there are a lot of dichotomies in this conversation right it's 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 not either or it's not uh, it's not that we can have privacy or we can have nice things right that's not true so there are a lot of privacy preserving technologies that are being developed i, I think you know a lot of the contract tracing apps that are being uh, developed you know certainly the ones that google apple uh, you know these do take privacy and encryption pretty seriously right and they're doing a critical job and so uh, maybe the we should be reframing the discussion a little bit and asking privacy should be the default right how do we make sure that that happens so yeah. how do we use techniques like you know federated machine learning for example how do we bring code to the data as a default practice rather than taking data to the code right i think these are the conversations that we should be having as a community actually I this is want to point out that we one upcoming uh, session uh, sometime down the line <clears throat> uh, with case studies there are particular mm-hmm. cases where data scientists have taken a position on uh, the privacy and built the entire tooling to meet right. that uh, i mean it was just a constraint uh, in their uh, design and right. uh, we will we have some exciting stuff uh, coming mm-hmm. up and if suchana is open to it i'd love to see if she has any views on it as well because i in addition to the systems and tooling there is also the entire angle of the economics of it where mm. initially when you see something that is free and nice mm. your your gmail your google search uh, your social media profiles um, you you don't know the cost of it uh, up until much later but okay. today what we knowing what we know about the the, the economics of it and how yeah. that privacy sliver uh, yes. of, of the of the whole ethical pie the privacy sliver how it's being exploited and what not um if you could change the economics of it that itself might be very interesting so for example there's a new search engine that's coming out called neva n e e v a uh, mm-hmm. unlike duckduckgo which is which is a privacy 
privacy based search engine but they do serve you contextual ads in neva's case uh, they it's a paid subscription you mm-hmm. want to search you will forever be completely private completely anonymized uh, mm-hmm. but you pay you pay for it so what okay. we earlier thought of as being free and we got used to it i mean mm-hmm. for the longest time or at least you know for for many years we could not have imagined with google existing why would we pay for it but now when we see Yeah. what is what can go awry then potentially the the thing opens up again and of course it will have to be subsid if it all it takes off it will have to be subsidized by the very rich who are most concerned about their privacy eventually driving all of the price down well that's where a, a, a role the role of economics and carrots aligning can can play a big part so i think this is where you know i'm kind of definitely wearing my ethicist hat and i'm going to ask uh, you know again throw out a provocation out there you know is privacy a right or is it a luxury you know should privacy be a premium feature in a product or should it yep. be baked in as a matter of course in the free version of the product and and this is something that i've written about before and i you know this is something that uh, kind of troubles me deeply as well that when i see a uh, you know a lot of people and i'm going to get very kind of practical here right so when i see uh, you know the the women who help me at home for instance when i see the way that they use their smartphones right uh, their understanding of privacy is not very sophisticated but they do have an understanding of it and they do see that uh, there is a gap here that you know they do have an understanding that they are having to sign away some of their rights and you know that they do understand that data is an asset which they no longer have any control over so is this something that troubles me quite deeply that you know should privacy just be a luxury feature uh, or you know should we be using i think these are areas where uh, regulation and and sort of government interventions can really help uh, should we be requiring privacy as a matter of course you know, yours is a pra- yours is a very practical question sushana because i think uh if somebody can if if uh, a world organization i think it was the un that can declare the internet a basic human right okay this this seems like only one or two steps from that it's not not far fetched what you're saying yes and and of course if you look at whether we want to admit it or not right social media platforms uh you know they, they have become part of our democratic infrastructure now. and so given that reality you know should we be asking these questions once again you know if privacy is a right then how how do we uh, you know i'm not necessarily saying that we should be nationalizing social media platforms in order to protect our rights and privacy no but how should we be governing these platforms yeah uh, agreed and actually to that point and to venkata's earlier point um, any thoughts on beyond the individual mindset and the individual value system what kind of systems and processes might actually aid this from a, a little bit more of a technology flavor to this yeah absolutely you know i was i was sort of hoping that uh, we would get into that right yes. so okay so let's see uh, i want to break this discussion down into uh, kind of four parts if if that helps right so i want to talk about the early phase of the data science uh, workflow where you are essentially doing exploratory data analysis you are maybe framing the problem you are doing solution design right and then the latter part of the workflow where you are actually prototyping a model and then you know the end stage of it where you are deploying it and you are monitoring its performance in post production right so in each of these stages like what are the things that you can do and what are the things that you should consider right mm-hmm. so okay so let's one of the things that i would strongly recommend doing up front is this idea of registering your ethics goals and what i mean by that is not that you're registering with some external third party right although if third party audits of algorithms become a thing then that might be a good thing to do but the idea is that whenever you're building an ai system it's a good idea internally to at least articulate your values Uh, and to talk about your ethics goals for the system right what are the fairness criteria that you wanted to meet what are the interpretability criteria that are relevant for the system to have what accountability structures are you going to set up how are you going to communicate with your stakeholders about it right what are sort of foreseeable points of failure what kind of adversarial attacks do you anticipate uh, you know what and if you exp- but data breaches are inevitable i would say at some point so what would you do to guard against something like that right so developing a checklist of this kind right at the beginning right and then also kind of recording your data governance procedures like your entire data pipeline where is the data coming from right uh, what kind of uh, consent and choice have users actually had in generating the data and how are you recording that and keeping track of that i think all of us have had these 
poor experiences with these cookie policy pop-ups that we now get on almost every single website that we visit. It's such a it's a classic example of ethics washing, right? Uh, yeah. You know, you you were <laughs> well. I, I don't need to explain yeah. that any further. Yeah. So, are you are you really giving your users any choice or control or any real meaningful consent here? So there are no right or wrong answers. All of these is along a spectrum. And again, I know I sound big, but it's hard to do this without concrete case studies, right? So it's a good idea to articulate where on this sort of spectrum of values you are and where you want to be and where the gaps are and how you're planning to address those gaps, right? So that's in the design phase. And if I, I mean, I'm constantly yeah, going back to the life of an average uh, data scientist, right? In one of the mm -hmm. many companies and mm -hmm. many folks that we meet. The, the challenge uh, that um, I am uh, seeing at some level is that uh, this requires a, an overall organization level alignment that mm -hmm. this needs to be done. This needs to be done as a certain way and that this is actually be, uh, this will be a valid consideration for the um, discussion because later mm -hmm. then the model will be evaluated against some of these things. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, again, some of these uh, uh, considerations. So the can and uh, individual. Uh, how 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 can a, a uh, how can a data scientist function in mm -hmm. a system where mm -hmm. not everybody is aligned to this objective, whether it yeah. is top down or bottom up. The, right. from top down. Even if the leadership wants uh, the average algorithm, uh, the average data scientist looks at increasingly looks at himself or herself as an algorithm engineer and mm -hmm. trying to maximize uh, a certain accuracy measures as opposed to the broad based uh, measures that uh, we are talking about. So how do you how do you see that friction in the organization uh, around uh, these objectives? Right. So I think, you know, one of the simplest ways that I see of addressing this friction is to ask what is the cost of being wrong? You know, uh, what is the cost to the to this particular product? What is the cost to the organization? So I think we are already seeing in the European Union, we are already seeing cyber insurance policies for corporations that take into account what GDPR fines might have to be paid for violations, right? So. <laughs> Insurance policies are already protecting organizations against that. So oh. the reason that I'm calling this out is that uh, I don't think it's the case that there isn't organizational buy-in for thinking about ethics at every stage of the product. Because if you, uh, at a very pragmatic level, just boil it down to the cost of being wrong, um, if the cost is high enough, no organization wants to be wrong. So it's, it's yes. about again, going back uh, to Indra's earlier point is about aligning the economics of this okay. thing. Right? Okay. There is a price okay. for not being fair, right? Because yes. of not liability or any other reason. Okay. Then the entire tool chain will align itself. The people, the process, uh, the yes. product, uh, everything. Yes, yeah. and, and in the end, you know, uh, isn't that why we advocate for market forces? Isn't that, you know, we hope that eventually market forces will correct things, right? So I... I, you know, I, I don't always, I think I could, you know, we could go down this whole rabbit hole of like edge cases of capitalism. Uh, oh. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole just now. But yeah. I'm almost imagining, uh, no, and, and even as I imagine it, I also discard it, which is imagine uh, uh, an, a data ethics score. A certification a score that this is where you you stood when we certified you based on a number of different audits. But because Suchana, I, I I know from your own past experience, you have helped audit uh, some of these things. Um, has that does that play into any of what we are talking about here? Have you ever gone back with recommendations to to people that you work with on the dimension of ethics? I. You know, so uh, this is something that's very close to my heart and I really want to explore this idea for a few minutes, right? So ethics is not so far from best practice. Ethics is not so far from doing your job well. So, you know, just to give you a concrete example, right? So I think you might be surprised. <laughs> uh, okay, anyway, okay. Do go on, go on. So, uh, you know, one of the tools that I love using in the exploratory data analysis stage is partial dependence plots, right? Because, and the reason that's so is because it helps me get a sense of the relative contribution or the relative importance of features to whatever I'm trying to predict, you know, whatever I'm trying to build. And this is 
in and of itself a great exploratory data analysis tool even if there were no ethics questions at play it just helps you to maybe sure. think through your modeling strategy better but it's also a great ethics tool right because it helps you to ask questions uh, about process fairness for example so when you think about uh, the fairness of prediction systems right there are two ways you can think about it you can think about the process fairness right what are the inputs to this prediction system and are they are each of these inputs fair are these things that i want to use to predict about people so for instance do i want to use somebody's uh, race in order to predict their likelihood of committing a crime right these are questions that society should be asking itself right so are these inputs fair and then there is sort of the outcome fairness part of it right so what i predicted is it fair across the board to the people i'm predicting on now for the process fairness part of it something like a partial dependence plot is a great tool to use because it tells you what are the most important most predictive most information carrying features in your model and and are these features that you are ethically okay with using for this particular prediction task so this is what i was talking about when i said that best practice goals are not necessarily so far away from ethics goals and maybe we need to reframe the problem in that manner particularly in our data science pedagogy right so when we uh, when we mentor our junior colleagues or when we teach data science to people newly entering the industry maybe this is how the problem needs to be framed that it is not a tension between it's not uh, ethics not aligning with your economics objectives and therefore it's a post hoc rationalization exercise no but it's more a question of it's best practice any way no, sure but if you zoom into this whole um, um, you the partial dependency graph that you are uh, uh, talking about right now what you are doing there is effectively applying your human judgment on the the or you are trying to um, infer the meaning of the use of a particular uh, feature mm -hmm. in the in the model which mm -hmm. you have to bring the cultural experience you have to bring a whole lot of other experience to be able to say what does it mean right when i am using okay. a particular feature as opposed to that other uh, feature now um, generally we are uh, you know as a uh, from whatever i have seen on the on the uh, street people are not asking that value judgment laden questions um mm. i was uh, wondering somewhere in this uh, whole process of um, uh, development of the skill of the data mm. scientist over a period of time somewhere that in the conversation we have to uh, in incorporate the ethics discussion as well right uh, from fairly early on any, any sense of how do you train a, a data scientist to be very aware and uh, have a questioning mindset or interpreting mindset yeah yeah you know that's why the science part of doing data science comes in and frankly i don't think there are any easy answers because uh, how do you teach any human being to be aware and reflective and critical right not just not, you know not just in their work but in their life as well there there are no easy answers here but i think we need to uh, so there, there are two approaches to it right you can start at the beginning of the pipeline where your your data science curriculum explicitly includes ethics and not as an afterthought but as very much a part of project based learning and you know ethics discussions happen at every stage uh, but it's also that we need to begin practicing it in our own work so that you know our junior Uh, colleagues look at the way that we do data science and learn from us it was very nice to see one of the biggest database names hv jagdish i saw uh, his his course uh, content around all of this this i would not have expected this uh, as a young graduate student even like some you know uh, 10 15 years back uh, what what was it specifically venkata that addresses he's he's one of the biggest names in the database right. he has he, he um so one of the stalwarts in the community has actively recognized that this is an issue and he is you know discussing debating running a course and training the next generation of uh, uh, database uh, as well as data um, engineers around uh, these kinds of questions i was going yeah. to say, you know, seen it from other other big names for example there's a lot of discussion around technologies but even the fat technology hey. often times gets boiled down to mechanisms exactly and, uh, it, it becomes uh, and misses the the larger uh, um, uh, choices trade offs and things like that it is yet another metric that needs to be optimized that is i mean algorithm engineering is what i call it right yeah no absolutely i think you know we need to acknowledge the fact that 
uh, a key part of a data scientist's job is to exercise their professional judgment to choose the right tools and algorithms. And this is a skill and it needs to be taught and it needs to be developed, right? So there is always going to be a, there's always going to be the next cool algorithm that comes along, right? And you just sort of blindly apply it everywhere. No, that doesn't make any sense. You need to look at your problem in its context and decide what algorithms and tools are appropriate, right? So that's, that's already a part of a, that, that kind of a critical evaluation of algorithms, metrics, uh, accuracy metrics is already a part of our workflow. I mean, that's what makes a good data scientist, right? So it's a matter of just extending that to asking, uh, you know, you know, all of these ethical uh, considerations checklist as well. So you, you talked about the first and the second phases you right. heard, uh, before we broke off into this uh, side thread. Um, right. Uh, right. So, uh, so, you know, going back to sort of, uh, uh, yeah. So we talked earlier, a little earlier in the discussion about what is the cost of going wrong, right? And this is, uh, this is something that has, uh, I strongly advocate for in the design phase as well and in the model prototyping phase as well. Once you do have something tangible in the form of a model that's predicting something, you know, you start asking what is the cost of false positives and what is the cost of false negatives, right? This is something that I strongly advocate for. Um, and then the, the next thing is uh, also, you know, just looking at, uh, documentation and reproducibility, because these things have a domino effect on your interpretability requirements later on. So, um, you know, let's, let's, just, let's just sort of talk about these different terms. I think they get thrown around a lot. So there's, there's interpretability, there's explainability, there is transparency, you know, accountability. So here's how I'm using these terms, right? So um, I'm talking about interpretability with respect to a, a specific machine learning algorithm. And when I say transparency, I'm talking about the larger system as a whole. So this ML model sits as part of some software system, you know, which predicts something and then takes a business action. And I'm talking about transparency as the transparency of that whole system. So unless you have good documentation, good data governance practices, and unless you're confident that your code is reproducible, your work is replicable, it's very difficult to have real transparency at the end of your pipeline, you know? It's not sufficient that you choose a particular interpretability strategy, you know? Let's say that your model spits out Shapley values or your model spits out, you know, some confidence score in addition to predicting what it's supposed to predict, right? Uh, and it's very critical. So this whole critical thinking piece, right? It's a uh, it's not a good to have, it's almost essential to the quality of the work we do. So there was some very interesting research uh, recently out of, I think, uh, Tübingen in Germany, you know, where they asked this simple question, what's the, you know, what's the difference between a machine learning system and a human brain when it comes to processing pictures of cats and dogs and animals and classifying them, right? And what they found was really intriguing. They found that human beings tend to focus on shapes in an image, right? So if I'm shown the image of a cat, I would tend to focus on the shape and not so much on the texture. But a deep learning system trained for the same task would typically tend to focus on the texture because the texture gives it an easy win, you know? And this is uh, this has all kinds of interesting, this is very exciting for me, it has all kinds of interesting implications for, for generalizing to other tasks, well, for robustness, you know? And, uh, the reason I brought this up is to say that, look, critical thinking is not a good, you know, it's not a good to have skill set, right? It's essential. The reason that this team was able to generate these super exciting results, which will probably guide research for the next couple of years, is that they were doing a lot of critical thinking. And, and what's really going on here is once you understand the difference between how a machine learning system might approach a problem and how a human being might approach a problem, it allows you to anticipate a lot of things that might go wrong downstream. So why is it that the deep learning systems are learning to, uh, you know, latch on to texture as the, the most informative piece of the puzzle? Because it allows them to optimize their accuracy. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. But what does this imply? So texture is also the, you know, is also that set of features which are particularly vulnerable to noise. So if you think about, you know, just, just close your eyes and imagine for a second what would happen if I were to take a picture of a cat and add uh, either certain kinds of specific noise or just general white noise to the picture, right? So the shape information of the cat would likely uh, be preserved, but the texture information would begin to lose a lot of detail. And so that's why when you add noise to these images, uh, a lot of these deep learning systems are, you know, vulnerable to adversarial attacks that are noise based. They, their performance degrades pretty quickly. So what does this imply? This implies that in order to build, you know, more robust, less vulnerable systems, you actually want to uh, build systems that are able to understand both the shape and the texture and pick up on both of these, right? So this has taught you something, you know, that kind of critical reflection has taught you something useful about building uh, less vulnerable systems. This ties into our, 
earlier point about um, ethics not being very far from best practice, right? Exactly, all, exactly. You know, documentation, all of it is uh, a big part of the conversation these days uh, for us also because you need the model to be uh, itself um, predictable and stable, if you will. Today, mm -hmm. if it gives uh, these results, tomorrow, if it gives some other results, how can we even interpret any uh, at any point in time or how do we even debug it, right? So, yeah. interestingly, what is happening is separate uh, thread is emerging from the need to build robust systems. All of okay. these mechanisms are being built and it seems like a small jump from there to be able to now understand um, these, uh, uh, add a little bit of uh, uh, interpretation, color, discussion around these best practices itself to be able yeah. to reach the next uh, stage. I'm so glad you brought that up, Vekata, because you know that was going to be my next point uh, about this particular study as well. So, uh, I, you know, what they found when they sort of uh, extended the research was that if you ask the deep learning system to articulate its decision-making mechanism, right? In a sense, you asked it to generate an explanation. Uh, it actually got better at recognizing shape in addition to texture because it was given this additional constraint of explaining it, explaining its decision, right? So here is, uh, you know, the, the reason that I'm perhaps kind of harping on this is that I really want to highlight the connections that exist, you know, these are not uh, these are not isolated considerations, you know, fairness on the one hand and, and sort of, uh, you know, robustness to adversarial attacks on the other hand or interpretability. These are not isolated uh, parts of the puzzle, right? They are all quite interconnected, you know. Uh, having an interpretable machine learning model allows you to probe it for lack of fairness, for instance. So there are all of these connections, you know. And so uh, the thing that ties it together is really critical thinking and, and sort of... Uh, you know, practicing that critical thinking at every stage of your workflow and not just at the design phase or not just during deployment or not just during performance monitoring, right? And the end-to-end -end discipline that yes. you talked about. Yes, right? and that's that's the science part of doing data science. Absolutely. We are going to, in the uh, next session, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, the science in data science, the experimentation mindset and things like that. So uh, right. uh, tune in for that. Uh, we are up to the hour, uh, Indra. <laughs> we can't hear you. I said uh, that's unfortunate that we are up to the hour because, uh, like I had predicted earlier, there are so, there were there were so many threads that emerged out yes. of this. Where is consent and, and harm? Uh, you know, where where do you draw the line? Where do values play a role? Um, and even this this thing where I was doing my kida about the difference between accuracy and fairness, where you can you know, define accuracy going down one path and fairness being somewhere else, whereas you hold a contrary view that sometimes we can come together. Uh, there's so much to probe, but we do not have the time here. Zainab uh, says, Suchana, we want you back. And I completely, completely agree. Thank you, Zainab. I think yes, we have lots sir. to talk about. So thank you so much for making the time. Any any closing thoughts from you, Suchana, that you want to share with the audience? Absolutely. So I think, uh, you know, we, we raised a whole bunch of questions and that was quite intentional. You know, um, I, I hope that uh, the audience is not disappointed that we didn't come up with a very handy, limited, convenient set of checklists and tools. Uh, we'll try to put out a resource in a few days, you know, where we do have some of these links, you know, tools and resources for you to explore further. But I really wanted to uh, sort of, you know, bring up to surface all of these questions to make the point that we should be thinking about these things as a community. There aren't, uh, you know, there's no one size all fits uh, right answer for and, and AI ethics is hard precisely precisely for this reason, you know? And so uh, I think I would invite on every data scientist, you know, every ML engineer, every product manager, everybody who's been part of the discussion today to, to start thinking about these things and to tell us where you feel we should stand, you know, uh, like, like what, are the, uh, what are the values that we should be articulating? You know? Are there certain values that should be, like I was talking about earlier, you know, are there certain values that are really non-negotiable? You know, is privacy non-negotiable, for example? And, you know, who should be deciding these things if we don't? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Suchana, uh, on the one hand, uh, all the listeners will have the opportunity to go to the HasGeek page where they registered for this or found out about this and add comments if you have questions for her, which we will relay her way. But if they want to connect with you, is there somewhere online that they can find you? Or do you are you a Twitter absolutely. user? Uh, yeah. yeah, Twitter is great. Yeah, so how can they find you? What's your handle? Uh, it's Suchana Seed. Wonderful. Thank you. And it is there in our posts as well. And yes. um, as 
uh, host, this is this is a very important topic for us. We'll stay on this um, for many weeks and months uh, yeah. to come. Uh, we are happy to facilitate uh, further conversations uh, on it. Um, mm -hmm. If the audience has views, uh, definitely they should uh, uh, write to us. And especially as an ML engineering company, we are very interested in mechanisms that will help with all of this. Auditability, right. big words for us, uh, very central words for uh, even us as an organization. Right. Uh, transparency and so on. So we are happy to engage in more conversations around the mechanisms. Of yeah. The Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Suchana, Venkata. Thank you, as usual. Yeah, and thank you, Venkata. This was a really wonderful discussion. And as usual, thanks to Amog and Zainab from Hasgeek for, for facilitating this, all of the infra, all of the Absolutely. streaming. Thank Absolutely. you very, very much. Thanks, Zainab. Take, take care, everyone. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye. Thank you.